Throughout my whole entire life, I lived a bulletproof life. You see me today, and I'm just bringing it real today. You know, you see me dressed like this. This is not your normal pastor attire. You know, and, and don't think I'm some gangster. You know, because you see me with my, my throwback and everything and my colors on and so forth and so on. So I'm just, I'm just being real with everybody today. So, um, I'm dressed like this, and reason being is because I'm the CEO of the Borinquenier's 65th Infantry Regiment Motorcycle Club. We honor and give recognition to the 65th Infantry Regiment of Puerto Rico, which was a, a U.S. Army unit but it was a segregated unit. In Puerto Rico, when the uh, United States took Puerto Rico over as a territory in 1898, U.S. Congress set up a, 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 a army unit in Puerto Rico, which was the 65th. They basically, the 65th has been in every excursion, every war campaign, in the United States since 1898. World War I, World War II, um, Korea, and then basically they, they went from a, uh, a regular army unit to Puerto Rico's National Guard, which still serves against the war against terrorism today. So just to go tell you a little bit about my life is I was born in, in the city of Brotherly Love in Philadelphia, which in, rea in reality, it's not, there's not that much love in Philly. <laughs> so, um, I was born in Philly. My parents had, had came over from Puerto Rico and my dad had uh, started up a, a, a grocery store over there. And when I was like probably like two years old or something like that, I had went back to, um, to Puerto Rico, reason being because I was a terror at home. I was breaking through the walls, like my, my parents couldn't take me. You know, I was eating paper toilet um, and so forth so, and so on. Like, like when my brother had his, um, all his toys, I like, I ran, I ramshacked through all his toys. Like the horse, I broke the horse, I, I broke everything that, that, that was around. So they basically told him, oh, ship that kid back up to Puerto Rico. So they let me loose. When I went to Puerto Rico, like, they let me loose. You know, I had, like, my, my grandparents had acres of, of farmland and so forth and so on. So, but it was one of the most beautiful life a, a, a child could live over there. Now, I was a little hibarito, more or less, you know, a little cowboy, you know, with my, my boots and, and hat. You know, just imagine me, you know, working the, the, the fields with my uh, grandfather, and I'm here on you know, working a plow, like, you know, I'm this high, working a plow, I'm here whipping on you know, huge oxes, you know, plowing, plowing the fields. You know, and also my, my grandfather was the butcher of the valley, so he used to come and slaughter the pigs and chickens and everything else and so forth and so on. So, um, after he used to slaughter up all the meats, we, we used to put, he used to pack them up on the horse, and we used to go from house to house on horseback. So I used to go on the back of the horse with him and what used to happen is that every time, you know, one of the baskets emptied, I would jump in, in the basket just to balance off the horse. So um, it was just an extraordinary life uh, with my grandparents in, in Puerto Rico. But then I came back to the States and I was working with my father in, in a store, which my dad kind of instilled those, those, those skills into me, you know, uh, of, of how to work. So, here, I have my little candy store. I have my, uh, my kind of like uh, box of cigars, but it was empty because so, that, that was my change box. You know, I had my dollar bills, my change in there, so I would just go in and, and um, have all kinds of uh, different kinds of candies. I also shined shoes. I had a shoe stand. I used to go and just shine shoes, or I used to sell water ice here, you know, wh whatever it took to, 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 to make money, you know. So, 
But then as I was growing up, um, I used to go to church every Sunday with my, with my grandmother uh, from my father's side, uh, Abuelita Juana. And every Sunday, I would go with her. It, through rain, through snow, whatever, I used, to, I, I used to go with her to church. And, and one of the things that she really instilled in me was prayer. You know, so I always used to pray for her and, and for myself. And she taught me, you know, to pray for my family and to pray for my teachers and so forth and so on. So I, I've always, you know, had that uh, knack of always, always praying. So to talk about my bulletproof life, I've been through so many basic shootings. You know, I had more than nine lives. Um, several times, yes, I had a couple of afflictions here and there, and so forth and so on. Um, but when I was growing up um, in the Keserton area, I was probably about eight years old, something like that, you know, eight to 10. And my um, front street used to be kind of like the barrier. Um, that if you went east side of the front street, you know, after six o'clock was kind of like, you know, it was a lot of racial tensions at that time. So uh, after six o'clock, if you went east of front street, you could, if you was walking, it didn't matter if you was driving, but if you was walking around, you could get, you could got jumped. If you went, you was on the west side of one street, you know, you get jumped by the blacks or, or Latinos, you know? So one day, and, I, and the thing is like, to go to all the main stores, you know, like over there they had Kelly's Corner, which is like kind of compatible to today's Walmart and stuff. So we used to go over there, so that's where all the stores were at. So one day I was over there and I was playing video games and so forth and so on, and I, I kind of like lost track of time. And I was walking back, and it was about eight o'clock or so. So as I'm walking, I'm trying to walk fast. And all of a sudden, here we go, I see like, uh, like some gang members over here, and they're already like, you know, saying, saying other words to me and stuff like that. So I start running, you know, and they start to give chase. So I went into this uh, abandoned building that was kind of clear, you know, nearby. And in that building, actually, we, we used to play SWAT in it. You know, this abandoned building had holes through the walls. Every window was broken, so forth, so on. That holes in the floor and stuff. So, like, I don't know what made me run through that building, but since I kind of knew it, like, I figured, okay, I'm going to run through there. So as I went through the building, I kind of knew the building, so I know what I was doing. So, but they were still giving chase. So I run to the first floor, run through the walls. You know, it's probably about eight, eight buildings across. And I run through the back. I jump across the back roof, which is about four, five feet. Well, you know, not that big of a jump. And still they gave chase. So I wind up climbing all the way up to the top of the roof. And then I'm thinking, they're still giving chase. So I come to the end of the, uh, of the row and I'm thinking, okay, where am I going now? Are you going to take a beat down? They're probably going to kill me, or I don't know what's going to happen, or they're going to probably throw me off the roof. So I take a couple steps back to, to get a little bit of momentum because the next roof over is, is about 15 feet across. So I just, I just jump on a leap of faith. I just took that momentum, and I, just, and I just jumped. And I tell you not, and I tell you not, I felt the hand of God grab me. I felt the hand of God grab me, and he took me to the other side of the roof and planted me safely on there. And then basically what I did was just then I, I, I slid down the cast iron pipe they had alongside the building, and I just slid down all the way down, you know, to safety, and, I was in, and then got away. I mean, I have many, many, many stories, and I'm going to try to keep it short, you know, but another... Another event that happened to me was um, I got, I was laying in bed, it was a school week, and it was about seven o'clock, my alarm went off, so I got up, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm stretching, stretching, and I'm like, oh man, like give me five more minutes. So I went back down. At that very, at that very second, I heard my window crash. 
And when I looked, there was a hole in the window. So I figured somebody first threw a rock. So I'm looking around looking for the rock, and then when I see there's a hole in my dresser. So I go to my dresser, I open it up, there's a bullet in my dresser. Then I really started freaking out, like, who's shooting at me? So I immediately went to the window, and I am started looking and gazing and saying, but one thing that I noticed that I didn't hear no dogs in the alleys. Because usually when somebody's in the alley, you would hear the dogs barking. So I kind of knew that bullet came from a distance, because bullets don't have no names, you know? So that was, that was another particular instance um, where at that moment, like, something just brought me back down. Um, another instance was um, in high school, I was hanging out, trying to get out of school early and stuff like that, and um, some friends of mine said, hey, we're going to go to Little Flower. We're going to go pick up, pick up some girls. Come on, let's go. And I was like, ah, no, you know, like I want to do something else. And they were like, no, no, come on, come on, come on. So I decided to go with them. So there's like four of us in the car. So I'm, as I'm driving, I'm getting, I'm getting to around like 50 Lee High, so forth, so on. And I, and, and I get this like pulling. I'm getting this pulling. And I'm getting something telling me like, get out the car, get out the car, get out the car. And all of a sudden it's like, I told the guy, stop. I like, stop, I, I need to get out. And he's like, oh, what, what, what's going on? I thought we were going over here. I said, nah, you know, so I made the excuse of that I was going to go play handball and go practice and so forth and so on and stuff. So that's what I did. So I got out the car, walked up uh, a couple of blocks to 5th uh, and, and Allegheny at, to the rack, and that was like my home base for, for, for playing rack, I mean, um, handball. So I stood there till about almost 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, and I was going back home. You know, actually to my mom's store because she used to close by nine. So I had to get over there before she closed up because I had, normally I had to help her like fill up the refrigerator, sweep the floor, do this and that. So when I get over there, I see my mom crying. And I ask mom, like, what's wrong? And she tells me, oh, uh, Fulana, Fulana, like, you know, Mrs. Mrs., you know, she just called me. She's a friend of mine. And she called me, told me her, her son got killed in the car. And I'm like, who? This kid got killed in the car. And like, I freaked out. I was like, I, like, like, my mom didn't know I was with them in the car. But my friend got shot and killed on a drive-by in the car. So I was like, oh my God. Like, to me, I was like, like, wow. And then I kind of started to think, like, 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 thanking and praising God and saying, Lord, like, thank you for, you know, for, for protecting me. So, after I graduated from high school, I went to the Marine Corps, you know, um, came back home. And when I came back home, it, it was like everything had changed. You know, uh, the drug game was like, like on fire. Like everybody was selling drugs, doing this, doing that. And what happened is that my dad had passed away. So I had to take, um, I was there to like continue my, my father's legacy, you know. So, but having all this, you know, bad element around me, you know, I wound up, you know, kind of getting in flux into it. So, um, another situation that happened was my brother, you know, you know, he's a notorious drug dealer, so forth, so on. I'm not gonna lie, keep it real. Um, so, I'm at my store, and all I hear is gunshots going off. And I go outside, and I see my brother arguing with this guy across the street, and the guy's just, just shooting bu bullets at, you know, towards the store. So I run out. Like, I, I, I didn't think nothing about it. I just ran out because I was like, I, I got I to hold my brother. I got to save my brother because, you know, my brother's going to get shot and killed. I wasn't thinking about myself. So I just went out there, and I just picked him up, threw him on my shoulder, came in, ran back in the store, and threw him back in the store. And we're like, you ain't going back out there. You know, because it was just like an okay corral. You know, bullets flying everywhere, you know? So that was just, you know, one, one, one of the instances. Another one was, as I was growing up as well, um, my parents had gotten sick, and I actually had to drop out of high school um, to work the store. And it was just me and my brother, 
And um, at the time, like, I didn't have a driver's license and stuff like that. So, like, we always, like, walking back and forth, you know, from, from the store into the house. So at the end of the night, you know, we take all the receipts, the cash, everything, boom. I used to put it in my backpack, you know, put it on, and we was just walking down the street. So we're walking down South, you know, North, uh, uh, Fifth Street, and as I'm walking down, I, I, I'm noticing this one guy walking up the street, and I told my brother, hey, listen, look out for that guy. Like, I was getting, like, this intuition. Look out for this guy here. My brother was like, ah, you know, don't worry about him. I got it, you know. I'm like, okay. But I have a bad habit of, like, when people are walking by me, I look them in the face. I look them right in the eye, you know. That's just the feeling in me. You know, so as that was happening, as soon as like I'm I'm looking at him, and I'm like in the back of my mind like oh no, like it's gonna go down, and I was like and I hit my brother, and I'm like, yo it's going down, and when the guy came out he was like he pulled out a gun, as soon as he pulled out his gun we pulled out our gun, boom boom boom, it was just like a showdown, because not for nothing, I mean we were carrying cash and stuff like that. So, you know, my dad had handguns in the store and stuff like that for, you know, for our protection and stuff. So, you know, and not to say it's legal, you know, but, you know, we were just protecting ourselves. So that day it was just like, it was just a showdown. So I'm trying to tell the guy, hey, listen, back off. Just take a walk, keep on going and stuff. Like, yo, let's, 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 let's kill this. So, as he's walking back, all of a sudden he decides to, you know, pop some shots. And I'm looking at him like, oh shoot. So when he's popping shots, we're popping shots right back. So then we turn around, we start running. So by the time I got back to the house, I was like, man, I got blood on my arm. I felt like a heat thing on my, on my leg. And when I looked, I was like, I had like a hole in my pants and, and my leg was beating out like from my shoe. So when I pull up my pants, like, you know, uh, the bullet had grazed, you know, my, actually kind of penetrated a little bit, you know, it kind of grazed my foot, my, my leg here. I still have the, the wound for that yet, still down today. And, and basically a little, kind of a little scar on, on the, the side of the cheek. So, but then I was like, wow. Like, I was just really thinking like, I got I got killed, you know? And I was just prayed to the, you know, I, I just thank God for his protection, you know? And, and there's so many other stories, and, and just one more candid story that basically um, I'm going to say is I had a, a friend of mine named David, and I'm driving in my van, and I'm driving down the block, and I'm like, I'm going around where David's neighborhood is at. And um, all of a sudden, it's like I'm running into all this gunfire. And I'm like, oh, man, like, what's going on here? All of a sudden, I see my friend Dave, like, He's one of the gunmen, but he's shooting back at these guys, and they got like three, four guys shooting back at him. So I was like, wow, I, like, I got to do something. I got to help my friend out. So I drove the van onto, onto the, the curb just to block the, the bullets from coming through. And then I opened up the side door, and I told, you know, David, David, jump in, jump in. So he jumped in the, in the van, you know, reversed the van out, went back the other direction. And I was just like thanking and praising that, that we didn't get hit. You know, I, my van had a couple holes, bullet holes in there and stuff like that, which, you know, David wound up, you know, reimbursing me for and stuff. So, but, um, but I think um, I never kind of fear death, so to speak, um, but I do fear God. So, those are some of the prime, you know, examples of of my bulletproof life. I mean, I have tons, I, I, could, I could go on till tomorrow talking about stories and stories and stories. You know, my, my son comes to me, hey dad, you got a story today? I'm like, uh, which one do you in here? You know, so one of the things that, that, that um, so I try to tone it down a little bit today, you know, because I did, I, I was planning to bring, roll in, come in here and roll in with my motorcycle, just rev revving it up, you know, right through here. But then, you know, I know, I, I know the pastor would have been looking at me some kind of way, and then, and pa especially Elder Barbara, she would have like, what are you doing? 
you know, so, um, but don't pass the marriage, you're like, yo, give me a ride, give him the ride, let's go, like, that's right, hey, 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 I, hey, 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 I know you, I know you, so, yeah, so, that's, that's how my physical sense of my bulletproof was, you know, especially, you know, living in the Badlands in Philly, it was just, um, you know, it was just like an uphill battle, you know, constantly. And, and, and I had to make a decision of what I wanted to do and, and, and to better my, you know, my life. And, you know, it was like the birth of my son and, and my wife were the, the, the main intricate parts that, that came into my life that I was like, I need to change. You know, I got to go from, from unlawfulness to lawfulness. You know, I had to go from being illegal to being legal. Because my wife would tell you, I had different social security cards. I had like three driver's licenses and different names. I had an alias list like boom, you know. Listen, I grew up in Philly and you, you got access to all that stuff. You know, so it took um, it took a lot of um, kind of devotion and prayer because I got tired of of the constant like things happening to me. You know, like why are these things happening to me? You know, why am I always in the midst of, of this trouble all the time? You know, why are people shooting at me, you know? And, 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 and it's not that I was at times looking for it, but at times I was, you know? Sometimes I was probably dirtier than a lot of guys because I was a nice guy, you know? So I moved to Bethlehem, you know, and to get my family out of harm's way, and especially with the birth of my, with my daughter. Because I think, I, think this was, I think this was the final draw. My daughter was a baby, and um, there was a nightclub that's next to my house in, 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 in Philadelphia off of Allegheny Avenue. And it was called um, Punto Blanco. And every, every Friday, Saturday, it was like salsa night, whatever, blah, 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 you know. And the one, the one night, I forget which night it was, but the one night, it was like gunshots, like going off all over the place, like all directions. Like people in front of my house shooting, you know, cause I looked out the window and I'm like, oh my God, like they're like almost on my front, you know, doorstep, like just shooting practically. And I'm thinking, oh my God, like, you know, they're gonna shoot back and the bullets are gonna come inside the house. So I was like, I'm telling everybody get low and stuff. And, and that was it. I was like, right hun? I was like, that's it. It's a wrap. I'm like, I put for, a for rent for sign, you know, on, on the house, we're moving. Brenda was like, santo, oh my God, hallelujah, about time. I'm going back home. <laughs> so, so that's the raw side of me, you know, that's the raw side of me, that's the raw physical side of me, uh, 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 of, of me being armed and dangerous. Because back then I was armed and dangerous in, in my environment, in my element. But now, you know, becoming a pastor and, and just the, the, the steps that, that, that led me to here because, you know, I was in prison. You know, my, 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 my past came behind me and snuck me and, and, and took away my freedom, you know, took away my family, took away my wife, my children, my daughter, especially my daughter, man. It was just like, my daughter was heartbroken. And, and that was so hard to like, like get back together, you know. It, that just took a long, long time for, for, for it to heal and stuff, so, um, so I'm here today, you know, to do the transition and to go from the arm and dangerous physical sense to the arm and dangerous spiritual sense. So as we go further into the PowerPoint, because um, I'm going to finally use the PowerPoint now because you're like, what are you going to teach us? You going to keep on talking all night, all day long? Like, so 
One of the main scriptures in the Bible that I've always read was Ephesians 6, the arm of God. And I've always truly believed in the arm of God. And I think that's one of the main reasons, like when I was a child and I used to read that scripture when I, when I was a child, like the Lord had sent his mighty angels upon me to protect me and to guide me and direct me all the time. So, what is the arm of God? The arm of God is a spiritual armor. It protects you from affliction, as it did me many times. Having the spiritual readiness of being bulletproof, wearing the armor of God. When you dress yourself with the armor of God, you're not just dressing yourself, you're dressing yourself with the oneness of Jesus. with his safety net. And once you strap on that armor, Jesus is with you. He's walking with you. So you, 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 you're going to be bulletproof. As we read, I'm going to read Ephesians 6 through 18. And then I'm kind of going to break it down a little bit, you know. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you could take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. After you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of, of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, going back to, to verse 12, it says, <clears throat> for our struggles is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of darkness, the spiritual evil forces, and the heavenly realms. So, you know, what are you struggling against? These are the spirits that come in the form which are the Satan's demons. And they come in many forms. And he controls all them. Okay? So we're not just fighting against physical enemies, but spiritual ones. So we are facing an army of demons that want to defeat Christ and his church. That's why we place our armor on and get ready in battle formation. Just as the military, you get in battle formation, you gotta get in battle formation. Shoulder to shoulder, warrior with warrior. I mean, I'm pretty sure you've seen the movie 300, right? Okay, how 300, 300 Spartans, 300 Spartans held back thousands, tens of thousands of Persians and how elite those 300 Spartans were. Everyone knew their position, everyone knew their job. So I say this, so be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Paul instructs us that we depend on God's 
strength, not our own, not mine's, not yours, but his. To teach us every day and to place every piece of his armor, Paul's telling us to hold for the whole church to arm themselves. Each and every one of you to arm yourselves with the arm of God. He directs us to pray in the spirit in all occasions and to pray for each situation and to pray for all believers. Now we're gonna look at the first piece of the armor of God, which is the belt of truth, which is God's revelation of all. That he is to us all that he has done for us, all that he promised to do for us in the days ahead. In John 14, 6, it says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. In the second piece, which is, now we have to put these in order, you know, because if we get these out of order, it ain't gonna work, okay? So it's very important you put the, the, the pieces on in order, okay? It starts with the, with the belt of truth, and then the second one is the breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness teaches us to know the truth about the, about the holy and perfect righteousness of Jesus. To those who are born again and filled with the Spirit. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those which hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now the third piece, which is the sandals of peace, for Christ is our peace. Christ has broken the walls of hostility when he gave his body on the cross. The fourth piece, which is the, the shield of faith, it teaches us how to live like Christ. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I know and live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now the fifth intricate part is the helmet of salvation. It shows us the truth about salvation through Jesus Christ. And it is the last piece to be placed on the armor. In the final act of readiness and in preparation for combat. So now you have all these, you know, you have all these pieces on now, okay? Now, you know, you're going to stand, you know, you're going to stand firm in the readiness, okay? And the assurance that God's salvation is going on and the impenetrable defense that you're going to have by wearing that armor. With the sixth piece, which is the sword of the spirit, is the final piece and the word of God, which is the Bible. It helps us know the truth about the word, which counters spiritual and deceptions and false accusations. In John 1.14, it says, the word was first. The word was God, and in readiness 
to God from day one. So once you have placed all the pieces of armor, pray in the spirit. For in verse 18 of Ephesians 6 tells us to pray in the spirit for all occasions and pray for all the saints and all the believers. With this, I'm going to leave with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and now and forever. Amen.